My name is Dan Fessler. I'm an anthropologist and the director of the UCLA Bidari Kindness Institute. I'd like to share with you today some thoughts on the pandemic that the world is currently facing. Now, a century has elapsed since the last great pandemic of a highly transmissible disease, the 1918 influenza outbreak. And importantly, science and technology have advanced exponentially since then. Just to give you an example, consider that the first transcontinental phone call was made only a few years prior to the start of the 1918 pandemic. Whereas now, you can listen to me from the other side of the earth whenever you want. Yeah, I recently attended a Zoom wedding for the first time, and I read that Walmart is now selling more work tops than bottoms because on a video link, no one sees that you're wearing sweatpants. So the world has changed rapidly and remarkably, and science and technology have been a critical part of this. This is important because science and technology are our best defense in the current crisis and make possible not only an eventual vaccine, but also the unprecedented social responses that are being instituted to slow the spread of the coronavirus. Now, I'm a scientist, but I'm not a medical doctor or a public health expert, so I won't be giving you medical advice. You should turn to the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization and your local government authorities for relevant information. Additionally, the UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center provides free online meditation materials that can help people to cope with the anxiety that these difficult times are creating. So rather than give medical advice, my goal today is to show how evolutionary perspectives can shed light on multiple features of the current crisis. I'll explain how human minds and human cultures operate and how diseases evolve. Throughout, I'll be emphasizing how differences between the world we live in today and the world in which our species evolved cause problems in the current crisis and how we can solve those problems. I'll cover five interrelated topics, our emotional reactions to disease, why social distancing may be even more important than we think, the processes of information transmission and why we sometimes believe things that aren't true, the role of cooperation in human evolution and how it affects us today, and how our species' history of cooperation and conflict has allowed 19th century ideologies to infect 21st century politics. So let me begin by introducing you to a fundamental idea, namely that just as our bodies have evolved through natural selection, so too our minds are the product of this process of natural selection. To give you an example, think about some of the common phobias that people have. So two of the most common phobias in the United States are fear of spiders and fear of snakes. The U.S. population is about 330 million. Every year, one or two people die of spider bites and around five people die of snake bites. In the whole country, out of 330 million people, a handful die of spider and snake bites. To put this in perspective, consider that about 12,000 Americans die every year from falling down stairs. So why is it that people are afraid of snakes and spiders, but they're not afraid of stairs? And the answer is simple, that snakes and spiders were a significant risk to our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Stairs were not. Our minds contain evolved mechanisms that make spiders and snakes particularly fear-inspiring, but there's no evolved fear of stairs mechanism because that wasn't a danger that our ancestors confronted. Now, as the example of fear suggests, many of our emotions reflect the challenges that faced our ancestors. So, turning to the current crisis, what protected our ancestors from disease? And the answer is the emotion disgust. If you pause and think about disgust for a moment, you'll see that it motivates an avoidance of contact, you don't want gross things on you, and a desire for cleansing, if they do get on you, you want to get them off and clean yourself. Importantly, it also reduces our appetite. Seeing something disgusting can cause you to entirely lose your appetite and maybe even vomit. And correspondingly, the mouth is the principal focus of disgust. Having growth things on your fingers, for example, is not as bad as having them in your mouth. So what elicits disgust? Well, around the world, the same kinds of things uh, cause people to have this experience. Things like feces, vomit, rotting carcasses, and so on. So why is it that we have these reactions to these, um, uh, these similar things around the world, such as feces, right? And our reactions include a desire to stay away from them, to get them off them, and to not put things in our mouth while we're um, in the vicinity. Well, What's going on here is that disgust does a pretty good job of protecting us from gastrointestinal parasites 
and from diseases that are transmitted via feces, for example. The problem, however, is that disgust doesn't do a very good job of protecting us against unseen microbes that are emitted by people who don't appear ill and that enter our bodies by being inhaled or when we touch our nose or eyes with hands that appear to be clean. That is, the, the emotion is not really serving us well in the current situation. And the reason for this is simple. Our species is about 300,000 years old. But up until a mere 10 to 20,000 years ago, all human beings lived in small, mobile groups of hunter-gatherers. This is important because highly virulent respiratory tract infections like COVID-19 were probably rare or non-existent in the world of our ancestors. For reasons that I'll explain later, these diseases require high population density in order to evolve. And high population density was only possible after the development of agriculture during the last 10,000 years or so. So our evolved minds are no more prepared for diseases like this than they are for a world of great tasting but unhealthy junk food. Our gustatory preferences reflect the needs of our ancestors, the need for high calorie food, for example, right? Um, in a world of supersizing that we live in today, those tastes do us a disservice, but that's because our ancestors didn't confront a situation in which they could go up to the drive through window and acquire two or 3,000 calories without expending any themselves. So what are we to do if disgust is the mechanism that protected our ancestors from disease by shaping their behavior to avoid the diseases that were prevalent then, but it doesn't serve us well in the current situation because the disease that we're facing now is a disease of a type that never confronted our ancestors. Well, I suggest that we try and leverage that disgust in interesting ways. So imagine that you've just changed a stinky diaper and uh, there's poop on your hands. You probably wouldn't want to eat a sandwich without washing your hands first. But most people don't have any problem grabbing the door handle in a public building and then making a call holding their cell phone next to their face. The solution to this is to use disgust by imagining feces on anything outside your home that someone else may have touched. And imagine feces on anything, your cell phone, your keys, your purse, your wallet, that you might have touched afterwards. Wash your hands. Be careful about what you touch and don't touch your face um, after you might have touched something that someone else has touched. You wouldn't want to do that if there was poop on your fingers. Just imagine there's poop everywhere. Well, what about the risk of inhaling invisible droplets exhale, exhaled by a sick person? We can't see them. We can't smell them. Our disgust responses are not elicited because um, we're not sensitive to the things that we need to be sensitive. Well, I suggest that you imagine that people outside your home may vomit at any time. If somebody that you saw on the street is um, potentially about to vomit, you would stay far back from them. That is, a good six feet is being out of puke range. So by thinking about the risk that others pose to us, and the risk of transmission in terms of the kinds of stimuli that disgust is sensitive to, things like feces and vomit, we can avoid the virus by tapping our inner disgust. Now, this mismatch between the kinds of things that elicit disgust and the kinds of things that pose a threat right now isn't the only problem that we face. In the world of our ancestors, close social relationships could only be maintained by close physical proximity. And critically, the survival value of close social relationships often outweigh the survival value of avoiding disease. You can see this in your own prophylactic responses today. So think about how you would feel if your child or your best friend vomited on you. Now think about how you would feel if a stranger on the street vomited on you. Put simply, gross stuff is simply less gross if it comes from those we love. And this is because our evolved mental mechanisms prioritize close social relationships over disease avoidance, because those relationships were so important to the survival of our ancestors. Well, the result of this is that we underestimate the risk that, um, of contagion that is posed by those to whom we are emotionally close. And as a consequence, people visit their relatives and close friends. And by so doing, they put at risk those whom they love the most. What's the solution here? Well, remember that you're probably even more dangerous to your loved ones than you are to strangers. After all, when's the last time that you hugged a stranger on the street? If you care about the welfare of people you care about, then stay away from them. 
Now, as these examples illustrate, there's actually another problem here, and that is that you can be infectious even though you don't feel sick. Our evolved mental mechanisms are only attuned to overt cues of illness, so it's difficult for us to grasp that we can be symptom-free yet still infectious. We can sort of understand that in an abstract way, but it's hard for us to understand it in an emotional way. Likewise, our evolved mechanisms are attuned to harm that is tangible and immediate, yet the harm that we can do others is transmitted invisibly in this current situation and occurs after a day, delay of days or weeks. I'm quite confident that none of those college students who were partying on the beach in Florida during spring break would ever intentionally run over an elderly person in a crosswalk, yet they're potentially doing exactly that by contracting and spreading the virus. What's the solution here? Well, if you see someone ignoring social distancing guidelines, you need to acknowledge in discussion with them that it seems safe. Neither you nor they feel sick right now. But despite that, this doesn't mean that either of you can't transmit the virus to the other or to someone else. How we feel physically is simply not an accurate index of whether we might harm other people by being near them. Now, those kinds of conversations, which, of course, you need to take um, you need to hold at a safe distance, six feet or so, right? Involve language, of course, and language can reflect the priorities and needs of the moment. People coin new words all the time. Just think, for example, phrases like gig economy, screen time, or trending weren't things a few years back. Well, I find acronyms particularly useful in this regard. To see two of my favorite examples, um, you can Google the origins of the words snafu and foobar, two terms that were coined during other desperate emergency times, right? So uh, I suggest that um, to have the kinds of conversations I've described with people who need to be reminded of the importance of social distancing, we coin a new acronym, a new word, PIPSA. PIPSA stands for Play Your Part, Stay Apart. So you can use the word PIPSA to praise people who are doing a great job of social distancing. Hey man, way to go, you're really pipsing and to remind people who might forget or who might underestimate the importance of social distancing. Now, I think PIPSA makes for a nifty hashtag, or you could use a Sharpie for something constructive and write PIPSA on your face mask or maybe on your baseball cap. Now, clearly, social distancing is vital. There's no question that this is a, a crucial thing that everyone needs to be engaging in right now. But I suspect that it might be even more important than we think. So why is it important right now? Well, no doubt you already understand the logic of social distancing in order to flatten the curve, that is, reduce the number of patients needing critical care at any one time. This is of paramount importance as it's something that can make the difference between life and death for many people. But this may not be the only reason why social distancing import is, is important. I should stress here that I'm speculating, as I'm not an expert on evolutionary epidemiology, but instead I'm drawing on my best understanding of how diseases evolve. Now, to convey this to you, I need to first explain a couple of terms that capture important ideas. Virulence is how much harm a pathogen, that is a virus or a bacterium, does to its host, the infected individual. Virulence can affect transmissibility, the ease which, with which the path, pathogen jumps from one individual host to another. So the pathogen exploits the host to reproduce. The novel coronavirus that we're confronting now uses our own cells to make copies of itself. The faster the virus reproduces, the greater harm it causes because it exploits its host to a greater extent. And in addition, pathogens cause symptoms, like coughing, for example, that increase the transmission of the pathogen from one host to another. Now, when there are many opportunities for interpersonal transmission, natural selection will often favor, favor greater virulence because faster reproducing strains both produce more copies of themselves, meaning there are more copies available tr for transmission, and they create more symptoms in the host that facilitate transmission. By reproducing faster, they do more harm to their hosts, and when there are many opportunities for interpersonal transmission, at the same time they increase the likelihood they'll be transmitted to another host. In contrast, when there are few opportunities for interpersonal transmission, then highly virulent strains of a pathogen will die out because their host will die before the pathogen has a chance to jump to a new host. 
In this case, the strains that persist will have a lower virulence because by allowing their hosts to remain not only alive but active, moving around the landscape and interacting with other hosts, the pathogen will eventually manage to jump to a new host. So when people are crowded together with lots of interpersonal contact and poor hygiene, there are many opportunities for transmission, and as a consequence, natural selection will favor faster reproducing strains, which are more virulent, that is, they do more harm to their hosts. In fact, this appears to be what happened in the influenza pandemic of 1918, as the initial outbreak was subsequently followed by a much deadlier second wave. This occurred during World War I, and troops at the front who were mildly ill stayed to fight with their comrades, but those who were very sick were sent back to crowded infirmaries with lots of interpersonal contact, and those infirmaries were located in the middle of densely populated cities with poor hygiene and poor public health. Because there were many opportunities for transmission, the more virulent strain became ubiquitous, and millions of people died as a consequence. So social distancing definitely saves not lives now by reducing the likelihood that critical medical facilities will become overloaded in the short term. And social distancing might save lives in the future by favoring the evolution of less virulent strains of the novel coronavirus that we confront. Now, as this reasoning should make clear, we're in a lifeboat situation, not a situation in which there's zero-sum conflict between social groups. The actions that individuals and groups of people take will affect the evolution of this virus potentially all over the world. I'll return to this point about lifeboats later when I discuss contemporary politics. But before we get to events that are happening at a national scale, let's stay focused on how individual minds work. As I noted at the outset, a hallmark of the 21st century is how information technology has changed our relationships with each other and with the world at large. To grasp three important implications of this, we have to understand the evolutionary psychology of information transmission. So all human beings depend on learning how to do things from other members of our species. We're an incredibly successful species largely because of culture, the information shared by the members of a society because that culture teaches us how to solve important problems in our world. However, especially during crises, we're also plagued by rumors, rumors that can be incredibly destructive. To understand why this happens, let me pause for a moment and talk about a simple piece of technology that hopefully you have in your residence right now, and that's the smoke detector. Now, smoke detectors are incredibly important little devices. They save lives during fires, but they're also really annoying. If your smoke detector is anything like mine, if you burn the toast, you have to stand on a stool and climb up and take the thing down, maybe push a reset button or take the battery out. And if you're in my home, you have to, you know, comfort the dog who's hiding underneath the table because he's afraid of the loud noise it makes. And you might think, why don't they just make a smoke detector that doesn't go off when you burn the toast? And the answer is because the smoke detector has two kinds of errors it may, might make, and it is engineered to make the least costly error. On the one hand, the smoke detector can go off when there isn't really a fire, that is, a false positive. You simply burn the toast. On the other hand, the smoke detector can fail to go off when there really is a fire, that is, a false negative. Obviously, there's an asymmetry in the costs of these two kinds of errors. The false positive is much less costly than the false negative. In the case of the false positive, you're simply inconvenienced. In the case of the false negative, you die in your bed. So the smoke detector is engineered to create false alarms, that is, to make the least costly error. And this basic principle of making the least costly error when perfect decisions cannot be made is a principle that is evident in many uh, of our own psychological and biological mechanisms that evolved through natural selection. Now, with regard to information that we acquire from other people, here it's important to understand that this asymmetry between two kinds of mistakes is particularly characteristic of information about dangers. And to show you how pervasive this is, think for a moment of what Americans believe about Halloween candy. Okay, Pretty much uniformly across neighborhoods throughout the United States, parents tell their children that they cannot accept unwrapped candy at Halloween or home-baked goods, cookies, cupcakes, and so on, 
or slices of fruit. And the reason that the parents tell the children this is because the parents universally believe that there are bad people out there who will try and harm children by putting poison into cookies or putting razor blades in, into apples, for example. Now, this simply does not occur. This is not a realistic idea. If you think about it, it's not surprising that it doesn't happen because uh, aside from being horribly evil, such a crime would be very easy for the police to solve. No one commits these crimes. Um, yes, they're bad people who harm children, but poisoning Halloween candy is simply not a realistic risk. So why do people believe that? Right? And the answer is because we have the smoke detector principle in our heads. There are two kinds of mistakes you might make here. You might believe the, um, the, the false idea that Halloween um, treats can be poisoned, right? or not only, of course, they can be poisoned, but that they are sometimes poisoned. right? And if you falsely believe this, then your children simply miss out on a few of the treats they might get at Halloween. right? Or you can erroneously believe what might be a true idea, that there really are bad people poisoning children in large numbers out there. And if you fail to believe that, your children get poisoned. In other words, our psychology includes a better safe than sorry um, principle when it comes to believing things that people tell us about danger. Just like the smoke detector is engineered to make the least costly error, so too our psychology has evolved to make the least costly error when it comes to believing what people say about danger. The result is that people believe all kinds of things about the current pandemic, things that are flat out false. They believe things about government's responses to the pandemic that are flat out false. And the result can be extremely detrimental. People can act in ways that harm themselves and others and make the situation worse rather than better. What's the solution here? Well, as I said at the outset, it's important to rely on scientific experts. And if you're aware of your own propensity to believe false information about danger, then you can check yourself. When you find yourself starting to see as plausible something that someone says, you can stop and say, wait a minute, why do I see that as plausible? And what is the authority that is providing this information? Is this really coming from a knowledgeable individual or not? Now, the problem of negatively biased credulity is compounded by our tendency to trust the validity of information that is provided by people whom we know. In the world of our ancestors, those closest to us were often most likely to have information relevant to our needs and also most likely to have our best interests at heart and to try and guide us along a true path. At the same time, the differences in knowledge between experts and ordinary people were relatively small compared to the differences in today's world. As a result of this, our evolved psychology leads us to trust information from our friends and family, even if those people have simply no idea what they're talking about. Now, mediated by 21st century information technology, this means that misinformation, urban legends, and rumors will fly through social networks, leading people to act in ways that are unhelpful at best and dangerous at worst. What's the solution here? Again, simply because it comes from someone you know doesn't mean it's true. Okay? But the situation is even more complicated than that, and that is um, not only do we tend to believe information about danger relatively easily, and not only do we tend to believe information provided by those whom we're close to, we also tend to believe information that comes from people who are successful, people who are prestigious. This is what's called prestige bias transmission, and it's another evolved feature of our minds. It exists because in the world of our ancestors, it would have been difficult to determine what led to differences in success between some people and other people. So that if you're going to imitate someone's behavior in order to acquire the successful attributes, the best thing you can do is simply imitate whole hog, imitate all the features of a successful individual. This is so because the successful individual may not know what leads to her own success. Is it because is she a particularly good forager, for example, because she gets up early in the morning, or because she sticks to the shady side of the mountain, or because she happens to have a taste for a particular berry or root that somehow enhances her abilities. This would have been impossible for people to determine. So as a simple solution, we simply imitate all of the things that successful people do. Now, as an aside, this explains why it is that celebrities and sports stars can 
sell us things that are unrelated to their success, right? Why do professional athletes get paid millions of dollars to endorse watches or um, breakfast cereal or, you know, life insurance? These things don't have anything to do with what makes them great athletes, but we tend to imitate everything that they do. And as a consequence, those endorsements are valuable to the company selling those products because they know that people will be more prone to buy them simply by virtue of prestige biased imitation. Right? Now, in the current situation, this is potentially very, very dangerous. And just to see how much damage can occur this way, consider the fact that measles had essentially been eliminated from the United States until the false link between vaccines and autism was promoted by celebrities. These are people who had no particular expertise. At least one of them said that she got her degree from the University of Google. Right? What we see going on here is that compelling stories told by prestigious people will spread rapidly and widely, be widely accepted, and yet can be entirely wrong. Now more than ever, humanity cannot afford misinformed and unscientific ideas about health and illness, particularly about vaccines. So what's the solution? Once again, I urge you to rely on scientific experts, not people who are famous or whom you admire for reasons unrelated to their knowledge. When it comes to the coronavirus, trust the person who has an MD or a PhD in a long career of research or clinical practice, not the person who has an Academy Award or an Emmy and a long career in the movies or TV. Unless, of course, all that they're doing is simply quoting the real experts and identifying the information as such. Right? Now, let me turn now to another feature of human behavior in the mind, and that is our incredible cooperativeness. But before we can get to that, we need to understand the relationship between cultural evolution and biological evolution. So cultural information is often adaptive because a society's store of knowledge increases over time as useful innovations or improvements are retained and passed on to subsequent generations. As a result, cultures can provide individuals to solutions to problems in their world that those individuals could never arrive at in the course of a single lifetime. Fundamentally, we are a cultural species. Our biological evolution has been affected by our use of and reliance on cultural information. And to choose just one example to illustrate this, consider the fact that we're not lions or tigers, but ancestral hominids, that is, species that came before our own, developed cultural techniques involving technology and cooperative behavior for hunting. And despite the fact that we don't have any of the features of a predator, right? We don't have big teeth. We can't run particularly fast. Um, we don't have sharp claws. Nevertheless, because of these culturally evolved um, uh, technologies, this affected the evolution of the human digestive tract. We have a much shorter digestive tract than chimpanzees, our nearest living relatives. And this is because we, as a species, evolved to eat meat. How were we able to do so? Through culturally evolved abilities. And those culturally evolved abilities, which shaped our diet, in turn shaped our digestive tract. Just as an aside, this doesn't mean that today we need to eat meat in order to be healthy, because today we have foods available to us that our ancestors did not. But the point here is that biological evolution can be um, influenced by cultural evolution. These two processes can operate in conjunction. So as I said, we are a remarkably cooperative species, and in part this is because our hunter-gatherer ancestors relied on cooperation. They simply starved if they didn't cooperate well. And correspondingly, our biologically evolved psychological mechanisms make us sensitive to cues about how cooperative other people are being. And importantly, those mechanisms make being cooperative ourselves, being altruistic towards other people and helpful that those mechanisms make these actions subjectively deeply rewarding for us. Being kind to others and being part of a pro-social group simply feels good. But this isn't just an intangible feeling. It is reflecting what's going on in our bodies, too. So to understand this, think for a moment about stress, right? Everybody knows that stress is bad for you. What is going on in stress? Well, put simply, stress is the experience that we're experiencing a difficult situation such that our future prospects are declining, right? We're basically in a situation where if things don't get better, things are going to get worse real quickly. The experience of that activates emergency responses to impending danger in our bodies. 
including inflammation, which is our immune system's frontline defense against infection, and elevated blood pressure, which allows the body to deliver more oxygen and nutrients to the muscles. These things are very, very useful in an emergency situation. Think, for example, of a car accident, right? This is exactly the situation in which you want inflammation to be upregulated in, in, in case there is injury, and you want more nutrients and oxygen being delivered to the, to the muscles to get you out of this dangerous situation, right? But the problem is that chronic activation of these emergency responses in our body can result in extensive collateral damage. These these responses are effective in the short term, but when prolonged over the long term, they do a lot of damage. One example that you may be familiar with is just cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is a consequence of long-term inflammation and long-term elevation in blood pressure. And the result, as everyone knows, the risk of heart attack and stroke. Right? So throughout human evolution, including today, being part of a cooperative pro-social group has been critical to meeting many of the challenges that we face. Working together, we can solve problems that none of us can solve alone. And the best insurance policy has always been knowing that others have your back. As a consequence, acting pro-socially feels good because it's setting the stage for being part of a pro-social team. It feels good because it is good. We're better off, both emotionally and physically, when we're part of pro-social communities because being embedded in those pro-social communities means that our future prospects are better. We don't need to activate those emergency responses, which have lots of collateral damage when they occur over prolonged periods. Now, few of us are pro-social across all contexts. Indeed, we describe people who are pro-social across all contexts, people who are quite rare. We call those people saints, right? Our evolved mental mechanisms gauge the value of pro-social actions in a given situation and adjust our motivations according to the actions of the people around us. In particular, we feel an inspiring, uplifting emotion, something that scientists call elevation, when we see other people being pro-social. And what elevation does is it motivates us to be pro-social ourselves. Put simply, kindness is contagious. We all become more kind when we see other people acting kindly. This is because when we see others acting kindly, this is a situation in which being pro-social is good for everyone. Now, the challenge in the present situation that we're facing today in the 21st century is that for the majority of us as individuals, cooperating does not mean putting our shoulders to the wheel together. A small fraction of our society consists of individuals who are on the front lines of this pandemic crisis. Those are the people who are heroically treating the sick, maintaining public safety, keeping our infrastructure and our food production and delivery systems operating. Those people are acting in the world outside their homes in a cooperative manner, right? But for everyone else, our first responsible responsibility has to be to avoid being near other people. Remember, PIPSA, play your part, stay apart. So as individuals, we all have a role to play in mitigating the impact of this disease. But problematically, social distancing doesn't feel like pro-social behavior. And the reason it doesn't feel like pro-social behavior is because in the world of our ancestors, helping other people and working together meant working face-to-face -face and side-by-side. -side. You can think, for example, about how good it feels to, to help a stranger on the street or to work as a team to clean up trash on a beach or repaint an elementary school, for example. These things feel really good, right? And this is because our evolved psychological mechanisms are sensitive to cues that we're part of a pro-social cooperative group. Indeed, even something as simple as synchronized movements in a group of people can increase affiliation among them, because synchronized movements are a cue that the group can coordinate its actions for a common goal. You may think about how great it feels to do the wave with a huge crowd at a sporting event or to sing the national anthem together with thousands of people. These things are emotionally moving. They feel great because we are sensitive to the, the situation in which we're coordinating our actions with that of many people around us towards a common goal. Yet in the current crisis, for most of us, the first pro-social action that we must engage in is to stay away from other people. And ordinarily, staying away from other people is selfish, not pro-social. So staying away from other people doesn't feel pro-social. It doesn't feel like we're helping anyone. It doesn't feel like we're part of a cooperative group. And thus, it does not trigger the evolved positive emotions that reward us for helping other people and make it feel good to be part of a team working together. Equally problematic, we don't see other people being pro-social. 
Kindness is contagious, but it's only co contagious if we're aware of it. If we're each isolated in our homes, we don't see other people around us engaging in actions that help others. Which brings me back to the remarkable scientific advances that have occurred since the influenza pandemic of 1918, including the technology that's allowing you to hear me right now. This technology incredibly allows us to both physically isolate ourselves for the good of everyone and help other people at a distance and also to coordinate our actions at a distance. So I encourage everyone to think creatively. How can you help? For example, millions of kids are out of school right now. Can you tutor children via a video link? Or maybe just read a child a story? Many small businesses are in danger of going bankrupt. Can you purchase products or services at a distance that will help them to stay afloat? Or maybe you can help deliver meals or medication to the elderly or to children who normally rely on school lunches and school nurses for their needs by learning about who needs help and, of course, conducting yourself appropriately with regard to the safeguards of hygiene and social distancing when you are making those deliveries. So think outside the box, get some ideas online, find a way to help other people while still playing your part and staying apart, pipsing. Right? Now, as I've said, humans are highly cooperative, but there's a catch. We tend to be pro-social towards certain classes of people. This is because both cultural and biological evolution have created a preference for our cultural in-group. For multiple reasons, for most of human e history, cultural evolution has increased favoritism towards members of our cultural in-group. So let's list some of these reasons and see why this has happened. First of all, cultural similarity will facilitate coordination. When people have the same ideas about appropriate behavior, then their actions can be coordinated with one another more easily. Just to see an everyday example of this falling apart, think back to before this crisis, if you were in an international airport, if the airport wasn't well designed with regard to pedestrian traffic, what often tended to happen is that people would run into each other. They'd do that ridiculous dance when they're going in opposite directions where I move to the left and you move to your right. And because we're going in opposite directions, that means we move to the same side. And then I move to my right and you move to your left. And oh no, now we're uh, again um, going to bump into each other. Why is this happening? It's happening for a simple reason, which is that in an international airport, you have people from all around the world. And some of the societies that they come from, people drive on the right side of the road. And in some of the societies that they come from, people drive on the left side of the road. And people tend to walk on the side of the highway, excuse me, the side of the hallway that cars drive on the highway. And as a consequence of this, there isn't a shared standard for which side of the hallway you should be walking on. And so you bump into other people. Now, this example might seem trivial, but it's critical in that it illustrates that we have to have the same standards for behavior if we're going to effectively coordinate our actions with others and cooperate with them. And people who share the same culture will have the same standards. So those who prefer to cooperate with their cultural in-group will have been better able to coordinate their efforts throughout human evolution. Now, in addition to the benefits of more successful coordination, favoring those who are culturally similar to oneself will have benefited the in-group as a whole. This is because groups that directed members' actions towards fellow group members, that is, who directed members to be pro-social towards others who are members of the same cultural group, these groups will have kept their profits at home, as it were, and thus would have been more successful than other groups that didn't differentiate between the cultural in-group and the cultural out-group as recipients of pro-social actions. So on a regional or global scale, the process of cultural evolution is occurring via the relative success of different groups. This has been a, happening throughout our species' evolutionary history. And three things will have driven the evolution of norms, that is, cultural standards, favoring the direction of pro-social actions towards others who are members of the same group. First, as I've said, over human history, Groups with norms that promote in-group favoritism of this type will have been more prosperous, and thus their populations will have grown faster than groups that didn't have these kinds of norms. Second, people will have voted with their feet. They move from less prosperous groups to more prosperous groups, and these immigrants will then have adopted the norms of the more prosperous group. So if in-group favoritism makes a group more prosperous, then it, the group grows not only through its own more rapid reproduction, but also through the attraction of new members, right? And lastly, and most troublingly, there's violent conflict between groups. 
Our species has a deep history of warfare. Warfare is not simply a product of the modern era, although the scale and complexity of warfare obviously has increased greatly in, in, in the modern era. And when there's violent conflict between groups, groups that are more internally cohesive and thus better able to cooperate in battle will win in competition with groups that are less so. Right? And this violent conflict will have created very strong selection pressure on both cultural standards and correspondingly biologically evolved psychological mechanisms. There's quite a lot of evidence that during wartime, people become more pro-social towards other members of the in-group. You can think, for example, of the legendary willingness of Americans during World War II to sacrifice and work for the common good. So just as a history of cultural evolution of hunting has shaped the biological evolution of the human digestive tract, so too has cultural evolution for in-group favoritism shaped the biological evolution of human psychology. The personal benefits of greater ability to coordinate with other members of the cultural in-group will have combined with the social benefits of conforming to cultural dictates directing us to favor members of our own group. And together, this will have meant that individuals who were inherently predisposed to favor their, their cultural in-group will have done better than those who were not so predisposed. The result is that from birth, all human beings are attuned to markers of cultural similarity we prefer interacting with members of the same cultural group. Indeed, very soon after birth, infants will show a preference for individuals who speak the language of the group into which they're born. Even though those infants can't understand language yet, they can detect the differences in sound between the local language and other languages, and they'll prefer to interact with, they'll direct their attention toward individuals who sound like they belong to the same group. Correspondingly, we're often more concerned not only with interacting with members of a, a cultural in-group who are like ourselves, but even with the welfare of those who are culturally similar to ourselves. So if you're a typical American, consider how you feel about a deadly tornado in the Midwest versus an equally deadly landslide in South America. We find more concerning harm to members of our cultural in-group than harm to members of cultural out-groups. Now, critically here, cultural in-group is always a question of degree. Large societies like those that exist today are composed of groups within groups within groups. For example, in the United States today, there are regional cultures with different dialects and different social norms in different parts of the country. And within any one region, there are cultural differences that are based on social class, on religion, on ethnic background, and so on. So there are groups within groups within groups. We are group favoritists but they're groups within groups within groups. And what happens is that depending on context, people expand or contract the scope of the cultural in-group toward which they're positively inclined. As I said earlier, war inclines people to be more pro-social towards the largest, most inclusive in-group. Violent conflict between groups leads people to identify with the largest social group of which they're a member and to be concerned with the welfare of other members of that largest social group, and to direct their pro-social energies and actions towards other members of that largest, most inclusive cultural in-group. For example, if you're over 30, you probably remember how united all Americans were after September 11. And that degree of unanimity stands in stark contrast to the divisions that have recently been tearing at the fabric of American society. So to sum up the key points on cooperation, people can be remarkably cooperative and pro-social, but their actions are often directed toward members of their cultural in-group. And the scope of that in-group varies by context, with violent intergroup conflict uniting people at the highest contextual level. Now before I leave the topic of conflict between groups, it's important to note another psychological consequence of such events. In the world of the past, the world that our ancestors lived in, Powerful warriors were particularly well-suited to lead during wartime. Indeed, leaders who could intimidate their enemies often led their people to victory. So our evolved psychology inclines us to continue to favor leaders who project strength, leaders who rattle their sabers during periods of intergroup conflict. Okay, now, with an understanding of the evolution of cooperation and conflict as a backdrop, we can turn to the nature of contemporary politics. Over the last decade around the world, there's been a rise in the intersection of three things, nationalism, authoritarianism, and populism. Let's take these three phenomena one at a time. 
So the author George Orwell, many years ago, usefully distinguished between nationalism and patriotism. In nationalism, one's only goal is advancing one's own nation's interests, independent of whether the actions of one's nation are good or evil. Morality is irrelevant because people see it as a winner-take-all conflict between groups of nations, between nations, right? Nationalism is not the same as patriotism. Patriotism is the love of one's country and the willingness to sacrifice for one's country. And nationalists often falsely claim that their critics are unpatriotic, but patriots love their country because of its ideals, not because of its borders, and hence they vo value a moral nation above everything else. Now, in addition to the rise in nationalism, around the world there's also been a rise in authoritarianism. That is, calls for strict obedience to a central authority at the expense of moral ideals and personal freedoms. And lastly, there's also been a rise in populism, the political strategy of appealing to ordinary people who feel ignored, exploited, or disenfranchised by power-wielding elite members of their society. So what has caused this rise in nationalism, authoritarianism, and populism? The answer, I think, is ever-increasing global inter interconnectedness, which has led to substantial economic dislocation of everyday people around the world. Seeing their livelihoods lost through globalization, people misunderstand globalization as a process of intergroup conflict. You hear phrases like, they're stealing our jobs, all the time. At the same time, income inequality has skyrocketed. A small fraction of society has become jaw-droppingly wealthy, wealthy, while for most working-class people, incomes have stagnated. Now, politicians seize on this, and they seek to solidify a constituency by portraying the situation as a zero-sum competition between nations. If they gain, we lose. And a situation in which elites exploit everyday people. In this depiction of the forces supposedly at work in the world, national boundaries are the relevant categories. Questions of economics and power, not principles or ideals, are the most relevant concerns. The need for projecting strength is critical, Hence, it's supposedly vital to have a warlike leader in charge who can tell people what to do. And in a particularly destructive form of populism, anyone who, by virtue of education and profession, appears to be elite should be ignored and sidelined. The result is nationalism, authoritarianism, and anti-intellectual populism. Now, the portrait of the 21st century world that nationalist, authoritarian, anti-intellectual populist politicians seek to paint for us is compelling to many people because it portrays the 21st century world as if it were the simpler world of the past to which our evolved emotions are attuned. In that world, like the world of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, intergroup conflict over resources could result in a true winner and a true loser. In that world, warriors led their people to victory, and in that world, disparities in wealth and differences in expertise were infinitely smaller than today. Now, this portrait of the 21st century world is fundamentally inaccurate. In the contemporary world, many of the most pressing problems are not problems of intergroup conflict. This is because today, throughout the world, we're all connected. We're connected through trade. We're connected through the flow of information. We're connected through the movement of individuals and even whole populations. And we're connected because human actions cause climate change that affects the entire globe. So the major problems of the 21st century cannot be solved through intergroup conflict for the simple reason that most of these problems are no longer winner-take-all situations. Instead, we're all in a lifeboat together, and whenever it starts to leak, we all need to work together or we'll all sink together. What's more, in the contemporary world, sidelining scientists, whether they be epidemiologists, economists, or climatologists, because they're seen as elite, sidelining in this way simply worsens rather than improves the problems confronting everyday people. Nationalism, authoritarianism, and anti-intellectual populism are thus triply dangerous in today's world. These trends trample the ideals of democracy and freedom. They threaten to undo centuries of scientific progress. And most importantly, at this time of crisis, they wholly fail to solve the pressing challenges that confront us. These approaches lead to competition, conflict, a lack of cooperation among groups and nations, and a retreat into superstition and magical thinking. All of this has been made starkly evident by the coronavirus pandemic. All of humanity is interconnected, and no corner of the planet will be left untouched by this crisis. 
Now note here that some politicians are attempting to paint the current situation as one of intergroup conflict. This is just a recipe for sinking our mutual lifeboat. The same politicians who previously told us that immigrants bring disease and crime are now telling us that this is a foreign virus, a Chinese virus. These descriptions are no more informative than saying that it's a wildlife virus, because of course this disease originated in wildlife. Why are these politicians framing the situation in this way? Because of their self-serving strategies that are advanced by describing the public health problem as a conflict between groups, and by ignoring experts' recommendations for the need to, to both coordinate actions across groups and to act in concert within the group. You need to understand that these politicians are trying to leverage our disease avoidance psychology by portraying members of other groups as disgusting and dangerous. What does disgust do? Well, it motivates avoidance and exclusion. So it serves the goals of those who want us to think of this as an us versus them situation. Now, problems on a global scale simply cannot be solved through a mindset of intergroup conflict and a disregard for expertise. To believe that a powerful leader who can defeat enemy groups will make us safe now is to fundamentally misunderstand the nature of the problems that we face. Right now, we're indeed in a war, but it's a war against a pathogen, not a war against another society. All nations need to work together to control the spread of this disease, to identify and deploy ways of preventing it, and to mitigate its economic consequences. Indeed, if the thesis that I described regarding the evolution of virulence is correct, then even if the world's economies were not inseparably interconnected, and they most certainly are inseparably interconnected, but even if they weren't, it would be worse than futile to try to retreat within national borders. Blaming other nations, failing to coordinate our efforts with theirs, and withholding aid from developing nations in need would simply ensure that a second, more virulent wave of the disease would eventually arrive. Authoritarian leaders who tell their followers that they alone can solve it are either foolishly mistaken or lying, since collective problems require collective solutions, solutions that are designed by experts, not by politicians. If the lifeboat is leaking, it doesn't matter which section of the boat the hole is in. Either all the passengers work together to plug the hole, or the entire boat sinks. Now, people around the world can rise to the challenge. They can shoulder their collective responsibilities in ways big and small. Individuals, neighborhoods, nations, and the entire international community can follow scientific guidelines and can work together. Our species is one of the most successful in the history of life on Earth. Thanks to the intersection of our biologically evolved minds and our culturally evolved knowledge, we have populated the entire globe. We're capable of both remarkable, inspiring cooperation and remarkable, horrifying conflict. Now, by virtue of our own success, we all face the same challenge. Only by acting as one can we overcome the current crisis. Everyone has a role to play, and everyone can help to keep the lifeboat afloat. It's sometimes said that every challenge is also an opportunity. In the globally interconnected world of the 21st century, we have the opportunity to experience the incredible power and the incredible rewards of cooperation on scales ranging from the local to the global. This crisis will eventually pass. Beyond hoping that the suffering and loss of life is minimized, I hope that this will mark a turning point in our species' long history. Ronald Reagan once said, In our obsession with antagonism of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bond. Well, we face that threat today, so let us all recognize and Therefore, henceforth, never forget our common bond. Thank you for listening.